Chapters 1 to 5 of North Lancashire, Cambridge County Geographies by J. E. Marr. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Cambridge County Geographies, North Lancashire by J. E. Marr, SCD, FRS, with maps, diagrams, and illustrations. Cambridge at the University Press, 1912. Preface I wish to thank Mr. K. J. J. Mackenzie, M. A., for information concerning the agriculture of North Lancashire. I am, as ever, grateful for the courtesy of all connected with the University Press, with whom I have been brought into contact while the work was in progress, and must specially thank Mr. H. A. Parsons, who undertook the production of the diagrams at the end of the book. J. E. M. May 1912 Chapter 1. Lancashire, Origin of the Word As Englishmen we are proud of our country, and we all know some of the reasons which led to the growth of the English nation, and caused its people to occupy that particular tract of country which they today inhabit. Each of us, further, is proud of his native county, Many people of all ranks, for example, young and old, take an interest in the annual struggle of the counties for supremacy in cricket. Yet comparatively few know the events which have caused our country to be separated into those divisions which we term counties. The irregular boundaries of these counties, which are so great a stumbling block to the young student of geography, suggest that the causes which led to the making of a county are by no means simple. At the present day, when divisions of a tract of land are made, they are often very simple. Look at the line which divides Canada from the United States. For a long stretch it is straight. Many of the smaller American divisions are bounded by straight lines. So in our country, new towns like Barrow in Furness and Middlesbrough are built with most of the streets in straight lines running at right angles to each other. In these cases, the whole scheme of the parcelling out is planned before the division is made. But in the case of many of our counties, there was no such principle of arrangement. They gradually grew up under varying conditions, and the boundaries were shifted more than once. These boundaries have usually been determined by some physical feature of the country, which could be readily utilised, and often formed an actual barrier between adjacent divisions. As we shall see later, Lancashire, and also the northern part of it with which we are specially concerned, is separated from the adjoining counties along part of its borders by hill ridges or by streams. Many divisions of this portion of country which we call Lancashire were made before its present boundaries were fixed. All of us must have observed that the names of many counties end in Shire, as Lancashire and Yorkshire, while others, as Cumberland and Westmoreland, Kent and Essex have not this ending. Shires are tracts of land which were created by the Anglo-Saxons, the word itself being Anglo-Saxon, and meaning that it is a part shorn or cut off from a larger tract. The term county is from the French word Comte, a province governed by a count, Comte, and it did not come into use until after the Norman conquest. Such counties as Essex, Kent and Sussex have kept their names, and roughly their boundaries as well, from the earliest times, and are survivals of former kingdoms, while Cumberland and Westmoreland were not completely separated from Scotland to become entirely English until after the Norman invasion. The name Lancashire was derived from its old capital town, Lancaster, the Roman castrum or camp on the Loon, from whence the names Longcastra and Lancastra, afterwards changed into Lancaster. Lancastrashire was afterward shortened into Lancashire. Professor Skeet informs me that no one knows anything about the meaning of the word loon. The statement that it is a British word is only a guess, and there is nothing to show that it is British. Lancashire is not a shire in the sense that it was divided from adjoining shires in Saxon times. In Doomsday Book we find the lands of the southern half of the county treated with those of Cheshire, and those of the northern half with those of Yorkshire. The boundaries of the county were practically fixed in the reign of William Rufus, but in that of Stephen 
the king of scotland obtained possession of the territory north of the ribble and it was not until the reign of henry the second that lancashire became definitely what it still is the county of lancaster lancashire then is strictly speaking a county and not a shire and it is one of the youngest of the counties chapter two lancashire as a whole in this volume we confine our attention to the northern half of the county only but before beginning our task it will be well to say a few words about the county as a whole and the relationship of the northern portion to the entire county the accompanying map shows the boundaries of the whole county and the relationship of that part situated north of the ribble which is the subject of the present book to the whole the part north of the ribble is shaded the greatest length of the entire county along a line drawn from the three shire stone at rhinos in the north to near stockport in the south-east is about eighty miles while an east and west line from formby point to the county boundary east of rochdale is over forty miles long the greatest length of north lancashire is about forty-eight miles along a line from the three shire stone to preston while an east and west line from near blackpool to stonyhurst college shows a width of about twenty-five miles the whole county has an area of one million two hundred and three thousand three hundred and sixty-five acres or about one thousand eight hundred and eighty square miles that of the northern portion being approximately four hundred and sixty two thousand acres or about seven hundred and twenty two square miles the population of lancashire by the recent census of nineteen hundred and eleven was four million seven hundred and sixty eight thousand four hundred and seventy four of these people over four million inhabited south lancashire and only about four hundred thousand dwelt in north lancashire it will be seen therefore that owing to the great number of industrial towns in south lancashire and their paucity in north lancashire the number of people per square mile is very much less in the northern division than in that south of the ribble lancashire is the sixth county in england as regards size yorkshire has nearly three times its area and lincolnshire norfolk devonshire and northumberland are each a little larger than our county which is itself about one twenty-fifth of the size of all england the shape of the county is very irregular that of the southern portion is more regular than the rest being of a roughly oval outline with the longer axis of the oval extending from west south west to east north east this part has few indentations of any size the ribble estuary forms a marked indent on the coastline and north of this river the width of the county suddenly contracts as the eastern boundary here advances many miles westward owing to this and the coastal curve of morecambe bay the county south of lancaster is very narrow but widens again to the north of lancaster up the valleys of the loon and wenning near silverdale the county of westmoreland comes to the sea and the rest of lancashire usually spoken of as lancashire north of the sands is therefore detached from the portion which we have already considered this detached portion is very irregular being broken by estuaries on the south and having a somewhat sinuous boundary line inland the county may be divided into the lancashire plain on the west and the high ground on the east much of the plain is in south lancashire but extends north of the ribble where the ground west of a line connecting preston and lancaster belongs to it the high ground is not continuous but is broken up by valleys and by lowlands around morecambe bay the high ground in south lancashire along the boundary between lancashire and yorkshire belongs to the pennine hills to the west of these hills are minor elevations connected with them another tract of high ground in north lancashire lies to the east of the north lancashire plain it is a nearly circular mass of which the eastern part belongs to yorkshire at the northern end of morecambe bay the kent estuary causes the most northerly portion of the county to be absolutely detached from the southern part this northern portion is largely highland part of which belongs to the english lake district the whole county is in contact with five other counties namely cumberland on the north-west westmoreland on the north-east yorkshire on the east derbyshire on the south-east and cheshire on the south 
the western portion from the mouth of the Duddon to that of the Mersey is coastline. Most of the drainage is westward into the Irish Sea, the principal river basins being those of the Loon, Ribble and Mersey. But about four miles southwest of Burnley, a very little portion of Lancashire is drained by streams which join the Yorkshire Calder and not the Lancashire Calder, and accordingly their waters are discharged into the North Sea by the Humber estuary. The populous nature of the southern part of the county is due to the large number of industrial centres, therein, of which Manchester and Liverpool are chief. It has already been noted that but few centres of industry exist in the more sparsely inhabited northern portion. Manchester is a cathedral city. The Diocese of Manchester includes most of North Lancashire, while the rest of the northern part of the county is in the Diocese of Carlisle, of which a suffragan bishop takes his title from the town of Barrow in Furness. Lancashire is not only a county, but a county palatine, being so made by Edward III in 1376, when he conferred the title of Duke of Lancaster upon his son, John of Gaunt, and gave him royal rights over the county, where he afterwards held his court. The reigning sovereigns still retain the title of Duke of Lancaster. The Duchy of Lancaster is not the same thing as the County Palatine, for possessions of the Duchy exist in other counties also. The River Ribble has been selected as the dividing line between the two portions of Lancashire, because it forms the southern boundary of a tract of agricultural land, which on the whole separates an industrial centre in South Lancashire, largely dependent on the occurrence of coal, from another in North Lancashire, which is in turn largely influenced by the rich deposits of iron ore. It is true that the large town of Preston, standing on the north side of the Ribble, belongs rather to the South Lancashire industrial centre, but apart from this exception, the division is a fairly natural one. Chapter 3 General Characteristics, Position and Natural Conditions North Lancashire consists of a tract of country of very varied characteristics. It lies between 53 degrees 24 minutes and 54 degrees 26 minutes north latitude and 2 degrees 28 minutes and 3 degrees 3 minutes west longitude. It is largely pastoral, though important industrial centres lie in the northwestern portion. The large town of Preston is on its southern boundary and the old capital of Lancaster is near its centre. Physically the area consists, one, of two fell regions of very different characters, the one lying to the north-west of the estuary of the Kent, and the other to the south-east of the lower part of the Loon Valley, two, of a large expanse of low ground extending from the sea to a line drawn north and south from Hest Bank to Preston, and three, of minor tracts of low ground, bordering the courses of the rivers and fringing the sea coast of the northwestern portion. The fells differ from each other in several respects, which will be considered more fully subsequently, but three types may be noticed. The high and often rocky fells of the Furness district, the bare step-like fells of the southern part of Furness, which extend eastward to Burton and Kellet, and the peat-covered moorlands of the district southeast of Lancaster. The lowlands are very flat, mainly less than a hundred feet above sea level, with tracts of mossland and river flats only a few feet above high tide. Most of the rivers are short and swift, and only navigable in their estuarine portions, save the Loon and the Ribble, which admit small vessels some little distance above the heads of the estuaries. In that part of Lancashire which is included in the Lake District is one large lake, Coniston, and a small one, Esthwaite water. Moreover, much of the shores of Windermere form Lancashire ground, although the waters now belong wholly to Westmoreland. Several mountain tarns are also found in the same part of the county. The coastline, owing to the indentation of Morecambe Bay, is fairly extensive, and there are important ports and watering places situated upon it. There are no forests, as the word is now understood though abundant coppice is found, especially in the lower parts of the valleys, with thick growths of hazel, birch, willow, alder, ash and oak, and these coppices have had an important bearing upon the industries of part of the district in past times. 
the climate is mild and the rainfall rather high as compared with that of the whole of england the scenery of the region is varied and much of it is very beautiful the fell region of the higher parts of furness is especially fine and the moorlands to the south-east of lancaster are impressive and form a marked contrast to the little valleys which indent their margins with few exceptions the hills owing to their generally rounded summits are somewhat monotonous but the valleys are in many cases very beautiful there are miniature but picturesque waterfalls along many of the river courses the scenery of the coastline is somewhat tame except around parts of the shores of morecambe bay and its estuaries where the background of fells often helps to afford scenes of great beauty there is much variety in the river valleys the wide valleys of the lower parts of the loon and of the ribble especially form a marked contrast with the upland valleys of the duddon and leven and there is usually much difference of detail between any two valleys chapter four shape boundaries when reading this chapter it will be advisable to follow the limits of the northern parts of the county with care upon the map and the variations in height should be noticed for the nature of the boundary is of considerable importance as bearing upon the history of the area the length breadth and area of the northern part of lancashire have been stated in chapter two as regards its shape it may roughly be compared to a figure of eight lying obliquely the northern half of the eight which constitutes lancashire north of the sands being smaller than the southern half in this comparison however all irregularities are disregarded these having been briefly noticed in chapter two and an inspection of the map will give a better idea of them than can be conveyed in words it must be remembered also that the two halves of the eight are severed by the estuary of the kent we may now consider the boundaries beginning with those of the portion north of the sands starting at the three shire stones the boundary follows the course of the river brathy to the head of windermere it then follows the west side of that lake to the foot where it turns up the east side which it follows for about four miles then over the fells for two miles to the village of winster in the valley of that name it then descends the winster until it reaches the estuary of the kent from the three shire stones to this point the boundary separates lancashire from westmoreland the southern boundary is along the coast and up the mid-channel of the duddon and its tributary cockley beck to three shire stone it will thus be seen that except at this pass and the little piece of fell between windermere and winster the boundary is formed by water either river lake or sea the boundary of north lancashire lying south of the sands is much more complex from the mouth of the kent estuary it runs in a general easterly direction by an ill-defined and very crooked line to the loon south of kirby lonsdale crossing the loon the boundary soon reaches easegill up which it continues to the southern slopes of gragreth along this portion also it separates westmoreland from lancashire but from here to the ribble the adjacent county is yorkshire the boundary still remains for some distance crooked and ill-defined it runs down the slopes of gragreth at a very acute angle to that part lying in the north so that a very small tongue of lancashire lies on these slopes crossing the river greta a tributary of the loon and soon afterwards another tributary the wenning it ascends to the watershed of burn moor part of the fell district lying south-east of lancaster from the slopes of gragreth to this point its trend is nearly south it now follows the watershed of the high moorland for many miles to a crescentic curve the concavity of the crescent facing eastward it leaves the watershed west of whitwell and descends into the valley of the hodder following that river southward to its junction with the ribble the ribble from this point to the sea forms the boundary between north and south lancashire and from the mouth of the river to the mouth of the kent the boundary of the southern part of north lancashire is the coastline chapter five geology and soil before giving further account of the physical geography of the county it is necessary to learn something of its geology as the physical conditions are to a large extent dependent upon geological structure 
by geology we mean the study of the rocks and we must at the outset explain that the term rock is used by the geologist without any reference to the hardness or compactness of the material to which the name is applied thus he speaks of loose sand as a rock equally with a hard substance like granite rocks are of two kinds one those laid down mostly under water two those due to the action of heat the first kind may be compared to sheets of paper one over the other these sheets are called beds and such beds are usually formed of sand often containing pebbles mud or clay and limestone or mixtures of these materials they are laid down as flat or nearly flat sheets but may afterwards be tilted as the result of movement of the earth's crust just as you may tilt sheets of paper folding them into arches and troughs by pressing them at either end again we may find the tops of the folds so produced worn away as the result of the wearing action of rivers glaciers and sea waves upon them as you might cut off the tops of the folds of the paper with a pair of shears this has happened with the ancient beds forming parts of the earth's crust and we therefore often find them tilted with the upper parts removed tilted beds are said to dip the direction of dip being that in which the beds plunge downwards thus the beds of an arch dip away from its crest those of a trough towards its middle the dip is at a low angle when the beds are nearly horizontal and at a high angle when they approach the vertical position the horizontal line at right angles to the direction of the dip is called the line of strike beds form strips at the surface and the portion where they appear at the surface is called the outcrop on a large scale the direction of outcrop generally corresponds with that of the strike beds may also be displaced along great cracks so that one set of beds abuts against a different set at the sides of the crack when the beds are said to be faulted the other kinds of rocks are known as igneous rocks which have been melted under the action of heat and become solid on cooling when in the molten state they have been poured out at the surface as the lava of volcanoes or have been forced into other rocks and cooled in the cracks and other places of weakness much material is also thrown out of volcanoes as volcanic ash and dust and is piled up on the sides of the volcano such ashy material may be arranged in beds so that it partakes to some extent of the qualities of the two great rock groups the production of beds is of great importance to geologists for by means of these beds we can classify the rocks according to age if we take two sheets of paper and lay one on top of the other on a table the upper one has been laid down after the other similarly with two beds the upper is also the newer and the newer will remain on the top after earth movements save in very exceptional cases which need not be regarded by us here and for general purposes in our own country we may regard any bed or set of beds resting on any other as being the newer bed or set the movements which affect beds may occur at different times one set of beds may be laid down flat then thrown into folds by movement the tops of the beds worn off and another set of beds laid down upon the worn surface of the older beds the edges of which will abut against the oldest of the new set of flatly deposited beds which latter may in turn undergo disturbance and removal of their upper portions again after the formation of the beds many changes may occur in them they may become hardened pebble beds being changed into conglomerates sands into sandstones muds and clays into mudstones and shales soft deposits of lime into limestone and loose volcanic ashes into exceedingly hard rocks they may also become cracked and the cracks are often very regular running in two directions at right angles one to the other such cracks are known as joints and the joints are very important in affecting the physical geography of a district as the result of great pressure applied sideways the rocks may be so changed that they can be split into thin slabs which usually though not necessarily split along planes standing at high angles to the horizontal rocks affected in this way are known as slates if we could flatten out all the beds of england and arrange them one over the other and bore a shaft through them we should see them on the sides of the shaft 
the newest appearing at the top and the oldest at the bottom. Such a shaft would have a depth of between 50,000 and 100,000 feet. The beds are divided into three great groups called primary or Paleozoic, secondary or Mesozoic, and tertiary or Cainozoic. And at the base of the primary rocks are the oldest rocks of Britain, which form as it were the foundation stones on which the other rocks rest and are termed Precambrian rocks. The three great groups are divided into minor divisions known as systems. With these preliminary remarks we may now proceed to give a brief account of the geology of the northern part of our county. In it the following systems are found and are represented on the geological map at the end of the book. Recent and Pleistocene, New Red Sandstone, Carboniferous, Silurian and Ordovician. The figure on page 24 shows what is called a geological section drawn across North Lancashire from the River Duddon through Morecambe Bay to Ribchester east of Preston and gives the arrangement of the rocks. It represents what would be seen on the sides of a deep cutting if such were made along that line. The oldest rocks form the northern part of the county, belonging mainly to the Lake District. This tract extends north of an irregular line drawn through Isleth, Dalton, Cartmel and Lindale. The rocks are known as the Ordovician and Silurian rocks, which are amongst the oldest in the British Isles, or indeed in the world. The Ordovician rocks consist of old lavas and ashes poured out from volcanic vents, with a band of impure limestone resting on the top of these rocks, and therefore of a newer age. The tops of the Coniston fells are composed of these rocks, and the limestone, known as the Coniston limestone, runs along the southeast flank of those fells from the head of Windermere to Millen, and reappears, owing to a fold, on the east side of the Duddon estuary. The Silurian rocks are composed of hardened mudstones and sandstones, the former often converted into slates. They form the ground between the line from Windermere to Millam and that from Isleth to Lindale, save in the small patch on the east side of the Duddon estuary where the Ordovician rocks reappear. Owing to a great earth fracture, a small patch of Silurian rocks appears east of Kirby Lonsdale. After the formation of the Ordovician and Silurian rocks, they were upheaved and their tops planed off and accordingly the succeeding rocks of the county rest on the upturned edges of the more ancient rocks. These newer rocks are known as the Carboniferous rocks on account of the occurrence within them of coal. Three main divisions are found in the county, namely the Carboniferous limestone, or mountain limestone as it is often called, at the base, the millstone grit in the middle and the coal measures at the top. Unfortunately, only a very small patch of these valuable coal measures is found in our part of the county. The Carboniferous limestone forms an irregular strip on the north side of Morecambe Bay and extends eastward to the county boundary on Gragreth and owing to a minor fold, it reappears at the surface far away to the south between Garstang and Longridge. The rocks consist of a white limestone with some shales associated with them. They form prominent features on Hampsfell, Wharton Crag and other hills. The millstone grit is developed on each side of the loon from near the point where it enters the county to its mouth, but is best seen in the high moorlands which lie to the southeast of Lancaster. It consists chiefly of massive beds of coarse sandstone or gritstone with some shales. The coal measures just touch the northern part of the county near Black Burton though the main mass, which belongs to the Ingleton coalfield, lies in Yorkshire. After the formation of the Carboniferous rocks, another movement took place, not so marked as that which followed the close of the Silurian period. The Carboniferous rocks became tilted and planed off, as the Ordovician and Silurian were, during the earlier movements. Another set of rocks, consisting chiefly of red sandstone, was laid upon the older rocks, these are divided into two systems, an older Permian and a newer Triassic, but the rocks of both the divisions in the northwest of England are very similar, and it is convenient to speak of the rocks of the two systems under the name New Red Sandstone. They consist chiefly of sandstones and red clays. 
the most extensive development of these rocks is found in the tract bordering the sea between Haysham and the Ribble, to the west of a line drawn from Haysham to a point on the Ribble, about four miles northeast of Preston. North of Morecambe Bay they form the Barrow Peninsula and Walney Island. A small patch occurs at Cark, and another of somewhat peculiar character near the village of Westhouse towards Ingleton. The rocks themselves are usually obscured by superficial deposits. These are the newest true rocks found in the area. Since their formation, the work of rivers and glaciers has largely been concerned in cutting out the valleys, leaving the intervening portions to project as the fells. Much of the work has been done by the rivers, which are able to saw their way downwards, thus deepening the valleys, while rain, frost and the other agents of the weather cause the material of the valley size to be carried downwards to the streams at the base, thus widening the valleys. At a time which, as compared with the formation of the rocks which we have described is but as yesterday, though remote as compared with the beginnings of the human history of our land, the district was occupied by masses of ice moving downwards from the upland regions towards the sea, and these masses of moving land ice produced well-known characteristic marks in the shape of rocks, rounded and polished by their action, which are frequent in that part of the county, forming a portion of the lake district. In addition to this, the ice helped to increase the depth and width of the valleys, and also left much of the material which it ground down and carried away, in sheltered spots and lowland tracks, to form the stiff clay, sometimes mixed with sand and containing blocks of stone of various sizes, which is known as boulder clay. This clay occupies much of the lowlands west of the line between Hest Bank and Preston, here and there the ice left large blocks, termed by geologists perch blocks, poised in curious positions on the sides of upland valleys. The lakes and tarns of the district occur in hollows, partly due to excavation by this ice, and partly to blocking of the valleys by deposits of boulder clay or similar material, some being due entirely to one process, some to the other, and others again to a combination of the two. Since the glacial period, the action of the weather caused the upper surfaces of the rocks to be broken up into pieces of various sizes, and parts of the glacial accumulations to be loosened, giving rise to soils. Of course, these are the following five main types, which vary according to the nature of the underlying rocks. In the slate tracks, the character of the soil is dependent upon the glacial accumulations which have in so many places covered the slaty rocks. Where the latter are uncovered by glacial materials, they are often bare of soil. The glacial materials give rise on the whole to a poor, stiff, stony soil, usually wet, though where much sand occurs in the glacial masses, the soil is looser and drier. The mountain limestone, when not covered by glacial materials, is usually bare. Here and there, a short, sweet turf occurs. Where glacial accumulations lie thickly over the limestone, the soil naturally resembles that of the slate tracks, but where the glacial materials are thin, a fairly rich soil may be produced. The millstone grit gives rise to a loose, porous soil, but as much of the country formed of this rock is high fell, there is comparatively little cultivable ground. The fourth type of soil is formed over the new red sandstones. There is often a light sandy loam of a red colour, but on this tract also variations are produced by the presence of glacial materials. The fifth type is found occupying the sites of former lakes, which have been filled in by gravel and silt, and also portions of the estuarine tracts. On these flat areas of lands, there has been as a general rule an abundant growth of peat, which yields a rich black soil. With the peat is mixed a variable amount of silt, which causes the soil to be especially valuable. End of chapters 1 to 5。Chapters 6 to 10 of North Lancashire, Cambridge County Geographies by J. E. Marr. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 6 Surface and General Features. North Lancashire may be divided according to its physical structure 
into four important divisions, two of which are upland, one lowland, and one a mixture of the two. 1. The highest ground occurs in the Coniston Old Man Group, which is a part of an upland tract of high furnace, composed of Ordovician and Silurian rocks. This tract also occupies parts of Cartmel. 2. South of this is an admixture of upland and lowland, forming the ground around Morecambe Bay, and to near Lancaster, and extending eastward on the north of the Wenning to the county boundary on Gragreth, this consists partly of low ground formed by the alluvium of the bay and its estuaries, and of the lower parts of the river courses, and out of it project hills of carboniferous limestone, the chief of which are those between Dalton and Ulverston. The fells east of Cartmel, the ground south of Silverdale, Wharton Crag, and a triangular patch of country between Burton and Holme, Whittington and Hest Bank. On the far side of the Loon, forming part of Gragreth, is a strip of high ground which belongs to the Pennines, and is the only part of that hill group situated in North Lancashire. 3. South of the Wenning, lying between the county boundary and a line drawn from Lancaster to Preston, is high ground forming part of a nearly circular tract of fell, of which the eastern side lies in Yorkshire. Most of the Lancashire portion is composed of millstone grit, though the carboniferous limestone appears in the south, north of Longridge. 4. Lastly, we have the flat tract between the line from Lancaster to Preston and the sea, all of which, save some little patches near Kirkham, is below 100 feet, and most of it very much lower. We will now briefly consider the general characters of these four divisions, taking them in the order stated above. 1. The first district is bounded on the west by the River Duddon, on the north by the Brathay, and on the east by the western shores of the upper part of Windermere, and further south by the River Winster. These all form parts of the county boundary, and beyond that boundary this fell region is continued into the lake districts of Cumberland and Westmoreland. That part of it which is in Lancashire is sometimes spoken of as Lakes Lancashire, it being actually part of the lake district. The southern boundary of this fell region is a geological line separating the Ordovician and Silurian rocks which compose it from those of the Carboniferous limestone which occurs further south. The line is irregular, running in a general east and west direction from Lindale on the Kent estuary through Cartmel and Ulverston to the Duddon estuary north of Dalton in Furness. We may subdivide this region into four minor fell groups separated one from another by valleys and passes. These are a. the Coniston Old Man Group, b. the fells which extend from Torver to Ulverston between the Duddon and Crake rivers, c. those fells lying between Coniston and Windermere lakes on the north, and between the Crake and Leven rivers on the south, and d. the fells separating the Leven and the south end of Windermere from the Winster. a. The Coniston Old Man Group is the most interesting, presenting us as it does with typical Lakeland scenery, and containing the most elevated tract in Lancashire. It is everywhere bounded by fairly low ground, having the Duddon Valley on the west, a tributary of the same, Rhinos Pass, and Brathy on the north, and Oxfordfell Pass, Udale, the head of Coniston Lake, and a depression along which run the road and railway from Coniston Village to Broughton on the southeast. The greater part of the ground is composed of the volcanic series of Ordovician rocks which cause the fine scenery. Coniston Old Man, the highest fell, rises to a height of 2,633 feet above sea level, but adjacent summits are a little lower. The chief are Greyfriars, 2,535 feet, Cars, 2,575 feet, Weatherland, 2,502 feet, and Doe Crags, 2,555 feet. South of the latter is the high level pass of Walney Scar, just under 2,000 feet, between Coniston Village and Seathwaite in the Durham Valley. A great part of this fell region is bare and craggy. There is little wood or coppice, but considerable stretches of peat in places. The other three subdivisions, though distinctly fell tracts, are much lower than the preceding, 
each of them rising to a height of just over 1,000 feet, and much of their surface is occupied by wood and coppice. They are composed almost entirely of Silurian rocks. b. That which lies between the Duddon and the Craig is divided by a north and south depression between Lowick Bridge and Ulverston, and a pass with a road runs westward from this depression to Broughton. c. That between Coniston and the Craig to Windermere and the Leven consists on the west of an inverted Y-shaped group of fells, with the Grisdale Valley extending southward into Rusland Pool between the two arms of the inverted Y. Northeast of this is a depression separating the inverted Y-shaped mass from Clave Heights on the west side of Windermere. In this depression lies Esthwaite Water. D. The fourth tract is again divided by a north and south depression, the Cartmel Valley between the foot of Windermere and Cartmel. Its highest point is Gummer's Howe on Cartmel Fell, which, though only 1,054 feet high, is the highest ground which rises immediately above Windermere. 2. Let us now turn to the area which we have defined as an admixture of upland and lowland. As previously stated, the portion around Morecambe Bay is largely composed of carboniferous limestone, though there is some new red sandstone. Much of the ground composed of the former rock rises into hills, but that made of sandstone is on the whole less elevated. These higher areas are intersected by the estuarine flats, and contain some mosses, which are partly of estuarine and partly of lacustrine origin. Beginning in the west we meet with the Furness Peninsula on which Barrow is situated. This is formed of limestone between Ireleth, Ulverston and Gleaston, and is there fairly hilly. South of this is a mass of red sandstone, forming undulating ground, except near parts of the coast where it is much flatter, and often covered by glacial deposits, alluvium and blown sand, as on Walney Island. East of this peninsula are the Ulverston sands of the Leven estuary, bordered on the east side by mosses through which projects higher ground made of limestone, which once formed islands. The large triangular mass of limestone between Cartmel and Grange rises to a height of 727 feet on Hampsfell. East of this lie the sands of the Kent estuary, which, with the little piece of land about Arnside belonging to Westmoreland, sever Lancashire into two detached portions. A mass of limestone lies between Silverdale, Carnforth and the neighbourhood of Burton and Holme, which last place is in Westmoreland, just north of the county boundary. The land here rises to heights of over 500 feet on Wharton Crag and in the neighbourhood of the Kellett villages, and is still higher east of Burton. Various mosses lie in this tract, some on the sites of former lakes, as Burton Moss and that around Horswater, others as Storrs Moss and that near Carnforth, marking former estuaries. In the low ground between Carnforth and Burton, and also east of this up the Keir Valley, are remarkable ridges formed of glacial gravels. Still further east is the ground bordering the Loon and Wenning, between Burton on the north and Lancaster and Wennington on the south. This is chiefly formed of millstone grit, and rises there to no great height. As before stated, however, we include here the triangular area of ground belonging to Lancashire, which extends on to Gragreth. It ought, strictly speaking, to be put in a separate division, forming, as we said, part of the Pennine Hills, but on account of the very small part which comes into the county, it is convenient to include it in the division containing the land, which consists of a mixture of upland and lowland. 3. The third great tract is the high ground south of the Wenning, and separated from the lowlands of the Lancashire Plain by the line drawn from Lancaster to Preston. It is markedly contrasted with the high ground of the Coniston group, being largely composed of rounded hills, often with comparatively flat tops, covered in many places with peat, though here and there the scarps of Milston grit form cliffs on the sides and summits, as is well seen on Cluffer. Much of this ground is over 1,000 feet high, and at Ward Stone it rises to 1,836 feet. It is diversified by considerable valleys, of which those of Roeburn and Hindburn on the north, 
Littledale on the northwest, Wiresdale on the west, Bleasdale on the southwest, and the western side of the Hodder Valley on the south are in Lancashire. Belonging to this area is the somewhat isolated mass of Longridge Fell near Longridge, which rises to a height of 1,149 feet and is separated from the main mass of fells by the comparatively low ground in which chipping lies. 4. The last great tract, lying between the line from Lancashire to Preston and the sea, is the least diversified. It forms the northern part of the great Lancashire plain. Save for a little millstone grit about Haysham, it is entirely formed of new red sandstone rocks, which, however, rarely show at the surface, for the country is usually thickly covered with glacial accumulations. These often form rounded ridges, which to some extent break the monotony of the scenery. Other parts are mosses, as pilling moss. Along the sides of the estuaries are tracts of salt marsh, while tracts of blown sand occur about Fleetwood and Lytham. The comparatively high ground between Broughton, Kirkham and Wheaton is the watershed between the Wyre and the Ribble. The watersheds between the Loon and the Conda, the Cocker and the Wyre, on this low tract, are badly defined, and these rivers wander hither and thither, seeking an escape to the sea. Chapter 7 Along the Coast The coastline may be regarded as beginning near Foxfield Junction, Broughton in Furness, where the Furness Railway crosses the estuary of the Duddon. From here to the mouth of the Ribble, the distance measured in a straight line is 38 miles, but the actual length of coast, measured around Morecambe Bay, and omitting the portions up the estuaries of the Leven, Kent and Loon, and the minor indentations, is over 70 miles. We will follow the coastline from near Broughton in Furness to the mouth of the Ribble, noting the principal features on the way. From Foxfield Junction, for about five miles, the coast runs on the east side of the Duddon estuary, nearly south to Ascombe, along low ground, backed by hills of slaty rocks, from a mile to a mile and a half inland. The low ground is largely moss, the principal tract being Angerton moss. Some way north of Ascombe, the former island of Dunnerholme, a rocky mass of mountain limestone, rises out of the alluvium and projects into the estuary. A little south of Ascombe, a promontory of blown sand, sandscale hawes, projects into the estuary, and at its southern end is the channel which, turning south, separates the island called Walney from the mainland. This island is about ten miles long, and is largely covered with blown sand and alluvium, once almost entirely warren, but now becoming built over by the extension across the narrow Walney channel of Barrow in Furness. Four smaller islands occur on the east side of the south end of Walney, namely Sheep Island and Peel Island on the west side of the channel, and Folney and Row Islands on its east side. Barrow itself with its docks has a frontage of upwards of two miles on the east side of the channel. Hilpsford Point at the south end of Walney forms the northern entrance to Morecambe Bay, and the description of the coast from here to Rossall Point is an account of the borders of that bay. From Rampside at the entrance of the Walney Channel, the coast turns into the north-west and forms low ground to Newbiggin. The whole coast between Sandscale Halls and this village is composed of Triassic rocks and is bordered by fairly low-lying ground. From here to Cark on the other side of the estuary, the Carboniferous Limestone forms the coast, except where overlain by the alluvial flats of the Leven estuary between Conishead Priory and Cark. Several rocky eminences, formerly islands, rise out of this alluvium on either side of the channel of the Leven, which is crossed between Ulverston and Cark by a viaduct of the Furness Railway. South of Cark, a mass of Triassic ground flanked on the east by a marsh extends into the bay, and east of the marsh is the elevated promontory of Humphrey Head, formed of Carboniferous Limestone, which borders the coast from this point to Wharton Crag, except where the waters of the Kent flow through between Grange and Arnside. The coast is fairly high at Grange, a sheltered watering place facing east, with the rocky home island lying off it, situated close to the county boundary, 
which here comes south down the Winster River. The viaduct of the furnace line over the Kent estuary is in Westmoreland, for the county boundary strikes across the sands, and accordingly the first strip of coast met with on the east side of the estuary is in Westmoreland. We soon re-enter Lancashire, traverse about two miles of rocky coast with abrupt cliffs, cross an alluvial tract, and find ourselves under Wharton Crag, where a low promontory, Ings Point, is made of millstone grit, let down against the carboniferous limestone of the crag by a gigantic fault. At Carnforth, with the high chimneys of its ironworks, the river Keir enters the bay, and the coast, which from Grange has had a south-easterly trend, here turns south-west. The ground now becomes low, entering the great lowlands of West Lancashire, though two imposing cliffs of red boulder clay are met with between Carnforth and Boltonley Sands. Hest Bank is a little watering place, beyond which the coast enters an alluvial tract on which stands the large watering place of Morecambe, three miles beyond which is Haysham, which has recently become important as the port of the steamers of the Midland Railway Company, which run from here to Ireland. South of Haysham, the new red sandstone rocks set in, and occupy the rest of the coastline, though generally covered by glacial deposits or alluvium. The coast once more runs south-east, for a semicircular minor bay extends from here to Fluke Hall near Pilling. Into its northern sweep enters the Loon through its estuary, with Sunderland Point on the north-west, and Cockersand Abbey on the opposite shore, while Glassendock is about two miles, and Lancaster about seven miles from the mouth of the estuary. The river Cocker enters this bay at Cockerham. At Fluke Hall, sand hills are met with, and extend to Rossall Point, being cut through by the estuary of the Wyre, with Knot End and the port and watering place of Fleetwood at its mouth, the former on the right and the latter on the left bank. Rossall Point forms the southern termination of Morecambe Bay. South of Fleetwood, the coast is nearly straight for twelve miles. It is formed of alluvial deposits for four miles, and then by somewhat higher ground with cliffs of boulder clay for a similar distance to the watering place of Blackpool, which extends for about three miles along the sea front. The watering place of St. Anne's on Sea is situated at the mouth of the estuary, and that of Lytham about three miles to the east. From the former place the coast begins to curve into the estuary of the Ribble, and is bordered by blown sands to Lytham. From Lytham, the estuary extends eastwards towards Preston, which is about ten miles from Lytham. A few words must be added about Morecambe Bay. At high tide, the water fills the bay and runs up the estuaries, the phenomenon known as the tidal bore being a feature in the estuarine tracts. At low water, however, not only are the floors of the estuaries exposed, the rivers being confined to narrow, often shifting channels, but large areas of the bay itself are bared, showing the Lancaster sands. These, as the name implies, are largely sand, but much mud is also brought down by the rivers, and here and there along the shores are patches of large blocks of stone called skiers. Four principal channels occur, those of the Leven, Kent, Keir and Loon, the first three being directed towards the south, and the last towards the west. But other depressions are found marking the sites of abandoned channels. From Hest Bank to Kent's Bank is the old passage of the sands which crossed the channels of the Keir and Kent. The traverse of this passage was accompanied by frequent loss of life. The entrance to Morecambe Bay is marked by two lighthouses, one at Hawes Point at the south of Walney, the other off Fleetwood, and a lightship is moored in the centre of the bay, four miles west-south-west of Haysham. A lighthouse north of Cockersand Abbey marks the entrance to the Loon Estuary. Another lighthouse at St Anne's on Sea marks the north of the entrance to the Ribble. The lighthouses all round our coasts are built and supported by a branch of the civil service known as Trinity House. The elder brethren of Trinity House obtain the funds for the purpose by levying light dues on the ships which enter and leave British ports. Minor lighthouses mark the harbours. 
the coastline has undergone various changes in historic times. Parts of the coast are worn away by erosion, while in other places addition is made by deposition of shingle and sand. A great part of the coast of Morecambe Bay, especially of its northwestern extent, has suffered loss by erosion, and some villages have been thus destroyed. South of Morecambe Bay, erosion has occurred from Rossall to a point south of Blackpool. From thence towards Lytham, actual addition of land has resulted from deposits. It may here be noted that some of the old salt marshes along parts of the coast, especially in the estuarine tracts, have been recently reclaimed by artificial means and converted into rich agricultural ground. Chapter 8 Watersheds and Passes The main watersheds separate the principal rivers of the area. These we may notice in order, proceeding from northwest to southeast. The north end of the Coniston group of fells forms the watershed between the Duddon and the Brathe, while its southern portion separates the drainage of the former river from that of the Crake. The ridge of the line of fells between Torver and Dalton also separates the Duddon drainage from that of the Crake, but in its northern part only, while at the south end the drainage from this ridge goes into the estuaries of the Duddon and Leven respectively. The fells about Cartmel form a watershed between the Leven drainage and that of the Winster. The high ground about Kellet sends its drainage into the Keir on the north and to the Loon on the southeast. The northern side of the great mass of upland east of the line from Lancaster to Preston drains into the Loon, while its west and southwest sides drain into the Wyre. Lastly, the isolated Long Ridge Fell forms a watershed between the Wyre and the Ribble, and this shedding line is continued on comparatively low ground to the west past Kirkham. The passes actually situated within the county are of minor importance as affecting the original immigration of the various peoples who came into the district, for they arrived chiefly along the low ground from the south, or else entered from the sea. There is no high ground in the district which absolutely divides two tracts of low ground desirable for settlements. On the Lakeland portion of the district, some of the passes are important to tourists, as for instance, the Oxenfell and High Cross passes on the roads between the heads of Windermere and Coniston Lakes, that of Rhinos between the Brathy and the Duddon Valley, now mainly a tourist route, was, as we shall ultimately see, of importance at one time as permitting the passage of a Roman road. On its summit stands the three Shire Stone, marking the boundary between Lancashire, Westmoreland and Cumberland. Other passes serve for the purpose of allowing pack roads to traverse the ridges at levels lower than those of the hilltops. Along these, produce was carried from valley to valley by horses, when the valley bottoms were barely passable, owing to dense growth of coppice. An example is the Walniscar Pass between Coniston Village and the Duddon Valley. These tracks are abundant in the Lakeland part of Lancashire, but their use has been largely superseded by that of better roads along the lower levels. Many of these roads are carried over minor passes, which the reader may study on the map at the beginning of the book. On the high land east of the line between Lancaster and Preston, three passes connect the lowlands on the north and west with those on the south and east, all being situate on the county boundary between Lancashire and Yorkshire. The principal, which is also the most southerly, is the Trough of Bowland, through which passes the road between Lancaster and Clitheroe. Another, about four miles northeast of this, allows of communication between Hornby and the Hodder Valley, and a third, three miles to the northeast, has a road which goes between Bentham in Yorkshire and the same valley. Between the last two passes, the old Roman road went from Ribchester to Overborough, near Kirkby Lonsdale, but it seems to have been carried boldly over the ridge summit. Lastly, some of the river valleys lead to passes which although outside the county are of importance as permitting communication between dwellers in the county and those outside. The low grounds along the Loon above Lancaster and those between Wharton, Crag and Burton lead up towards the Shat Pass in Westmoreland, giving communication with the lowlands of northern Westmoreland and Cumberland and so with Scotland. 
the Loon Valley above Lancaster and the Wenning Valley allow of communication with the Ribble Valley by a low pass near Giggleswick, and as the Ribble Valley is near Hellifield, separated from the Aire by another low pass, there is ready access between the country around Lancaster and Preston and the populous part of the West Riding of Yorkshire. These routes have been of great importance from very early times, as will be seen when the Roman roads are described. Chapter 9. Rivers. The rivers of North Lancashire flow into Morecambe Bay, with the exception of the Boundary River, the Duddon, on the north-west, and the Ribble, which we have taken as our division between North and South Lancashire on the south. We may consider them in order, beginning with the Duddon. The River Duddon rises at Three Shirestone, where Cumberland, Westmoreland and Lancashire join, and it forms the boundary between Lancashire and Cumberland from source to sea, a distance of about 15 miles. It is essentially a Lakeland River, flowing through the Ordovician volcanic rocks from its source to the estuary. The waters are swift and clear, and the hills rise to considerable elevation on either side of the river banks. The estuarine portion has been noticed in the chapter treating of the sea coast. The Crake, flowing from Coniston Lake, joins the Leven at Greenodd, about six miles below the point where it quits the lake. Proceeding eastward, the next river of importance is the Leven, which flows in from the foot of Windermere to its estuary. Above Windermere, two important feeders belong to the drainage of the Leven Basin. One, the Rothy, is in Westmoreland. The other, the Brathe, rises at Three Shirestone in the direction opposite to that taken by the infant Duddon, and forms the county boundary between Lancashire and Westmoreland, from its source to its termination in Windermere. The Leven itself below Windermere flows through a narrow valley for about four miles to the village of Haverthwaite, there it enters the alluvial flat at the head of the partially silted up estuary, and about Greenodd, a little lower down, the estuary proper begins. The scenery of the estuarine part of the Leven is very fine. Proceeding again eastward, we reach the estuary of the Kent. This river is in Westmoreland, but a portion of the estuary near Grange over Sands is in Lancashire, and the Winster, which enters the estuary just above Grange, forms the county boundary between Westmoreland and Lancashire, along the greater part of its course. The Keir rises south of Hutton Roof, and for a short distance forms the county boundary. After a course of a few miles, it enters Morecambe Bay at Carnforth. Though the river is small, it flows through a large valley, and there is reason to believe that in times before the glacial period, the Loon itself found its way to the sea along the lower part of this valley. The Loon rises far away north of the county boundary on the northern slopes of Howgill Fells in Westmoreland. About 30 miles from its source, it enters Lancashire Territory, just south of Kirkby Lonsdale. From that point to the sea, at the mouth of the estuary, is a distance of a little over 20 miles. The views in the Loon Valley between Kirkby Lonsdale and Lancaster are very beautiful. In many places the great mass of Ingleborough is seen in the background when looking up the valley. Near Tunstall, the Greta, flowing from the east, joins the Loon, and below Hornby, the more important Wenning, which rises near Clapham in Yorkshire. The Wenning itself receives the united waters of two streams, the Hindburn and the Roeburn, which rise on the millstone grit fells east of Lancaster, and flow northward to unite at Ray. From Tunstall to Caton, the river flows through a wide valley with alluvial floor, but below Caton the valley narrows to a point just above Lancaster, and on leaving the alluvial flat flows in a loop, the celebrated Crook of Loon. At Lancaster the river becomes tidal, and no great distance below that town the estuary begins. The Conda rises near Caton. Like the Keir, its source is close to the Loon, and the watershed between is low. The stream flows a little west of south to Ellel, and then turns northwest to enter the estuary of the Loon at Glasson Dock. The Wyre has its source towards the centre of the high mass of Milston Grit fells near the Trough of Bowland. It flows westward in an upland valley to Dolphinholme, where it enters low ground, and turns first south to Garstang and Catterall, 
then southwest to St. Michael's, west to near Poulton, and lastly northwest to Fleetwood, where it enters Morecambe Bay. Leaving out of account minor windings, the total length of its course is about 25 miles. The Ribble rises in Yorkshire at Ribblehead, 10 miles north of Settle. About 24 miles from its source, it reaches Lancashire, and forms the boundary between Lancashire and Yorkshire to the River Hodder, where it flows entirely in Lancashire, and at this point begins to form the boundary of that portion of Lancashire with which we are concerned. The Hodder rises in the circular mass of Milston Grit Fells in Yorkshire, and touches Lancashire above Whitewell, forming the county boundary from there to its junction with the Ribble. The Ribble flows through fairly high country from its source to the neighbourhood of Preston, though the valley itself is in most places wide. Above Preston it enters low ground, soon becomes tidal, and at no great distance below Preston the estuary proper begins. The estuarine portion is about 12 miles in length, and the whole length of the river from source to sea, omitting windings, is over 50 miles. Chapter 10 Lakes It was remarked in Chapter 3 that the only large lake situated in Lancashire are Coniston and Esthwaite, but as a great part of the shores of Windermere are Lancashire soil, we must say something about this lake. Windermere has a length of ten and a half miles, and covers an area of five and seven-tenths square miles. Its maximum breadth is just under a mile opposite Milliground Bay, and the average breadth just over half a mile. It is 130 feet above sea level, and drains an area of nearly 90 square miles, most of which is in Westmoreland. The greatest depth is at 219 feet, at a distance of a mile and a half from the lake head. The lake runs nearly north and south, but the upper part bends slightly westward, towards the head. The shores are not greatly indented, Pullwike, near the head on the western side, being the most marked bay. Many islets or homes occur, but all are in Westmoreland. Esthwaite Water is a smaller lake between Windermere and Coniston, near the little town of Hawkshead. It is about one and a half miles in length, and less than half a mile wide, with a depth of about eighty feet. It lies nearly north and south, and from it flows a small beck, Cunsey Beck, into Windermere. Coniston Lake is almost parallel with the lower part of Windermere, and lies nearly north and south. Its length is nearly five and a half miles, and it has an area of a little under two square miles. Its greatest width is just under half a mile. It is 143 feet above sea level, and drains an area of 23 square miles. The greatest depth is 184 feet near the centre of the lake. The sides approach straightness, and there is only one important bay, north of Coniston Hall. Two small islets occur on the east side, close to the shore. Fir Island, about halfway down, is a low flat pile of stones, nearly touching the shore, while Peel Island, towards the foot, is formed of well-glaciated rock, rising out of deep water. The head of the lake is being filled up by the alluvium brought down by a small stream, and about a mile south of the head, a large delta has been built by Church Beck on the west side of the lake and still lower on the same side is the delta of Torver Beck. North Lancashire possesses several tarns. The term tarn is generally applied to a small lake, usually less than half a mile in length. Many tarns lie in hollow combes on the hillsides of the old man group, far above the floors of the main valleys, and in many cases the streams which come from them flow in cascades down the sides of the larger valleys. Other tarns are situated in the lowlands. In upland and lowland alike, there were formerly many more which have now become filled up, and their sites converted into peat bogs. The tarns are all situated in the northern part of the district, except the little Martin Mere east of Blackpool. Five occur in combes on Coniston Old Man and the adjacent fells, namely Leaver's Water, Low Water, Goat's Water, and Blind Tarn on the western side, and Seathwaite Tarn on the east. The last named, which was the largest, has now been converted into a reservoir for Barrow-in-Furness. Low Water, 
notwithstanding its name, is at a great altitude, being 1,786 feet above sea level, while the little blind tarn, below Doe Crags, which has no stream issuing from it, is 1,842 feet above the sea. A small pool, Bhutan, on the road from Coniston to Walney Scar, has an exit at each end. Two little upland tarns north of Coniston Waterhead have been raised to form one artificial lake, Tarn House, celebrated for the beautiful views obtained therefrom. Two somewhat similarly placed lakelets, High and Boar Tree Tarns, lie west of the south end of Windermere. Of valley tarns in the Lake District portion of the county are Little Langdale Tarn and Elterwater in the course of the River Brathy, along which the county boundary runs. Blelham Tarn, south of Pullwike Bay, Windermere, and two pools, one near the head and the other near the foot of Esthwaite, of which they once formed a portion, being now separated from it by alluvium. In the lowlands, mention may be made of three tarns, Urswick Tarn near the village of that name, Horswater near Silverdale, and Martin Mere near Blackpool. In addition, there are some smaller sheets, scarcely more than pools. End of chapters 6 to 10「Chapters 11 to 14 of North Lancashire, Cambridge County Geographies by J. E. Marr. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11. Scenery. In a district of which the scenery is an important factor affecting the inhabitants, some attention must be paid to its causes and character. These are dependent partly upon the geological structure partly upon meteorological conditions, whether acting directly, for example, the effects of sunlight and clouds upon the view, or indirectly, as affecting the vegetation, and partly also upon agents such as frost, rivers and glaciers, by which the details of the scenery have been largely determined. At the outset, we may take into account the effects of the more important rock groups in controlling the nature of the surface. The volcanic rocks of the Ordovician system are responsible for the wildest scenery in the county. They are the hardest of the rocks, which are extensively found, and as there is considerable variety in their hardness, the lavas and many of the volcanic ashes being peculiarly hard, while some of the ashes are softer, a considerable diversity of outline is thus called by these alternations. Again, they are affected by very regular systems of gigantic cracks or joints, often with belts of smashed rock along the cracks, and these cracks have been lines of weakness which have frequently been worn into notches and gorges, and they also define the sides of cliffs. To the hardness of the rocks we owe in a great degree the superior elevation of the fells which are composed of them, and to the variations of hardness and the nature of the joints are due the frequent alternations of cliff and slope which are so marks a feature of these fells. These alternations are well displayed in the hills of the Coniston group. The Coniston limestone is too narrow to produce important scenic effects. The Silurian rocks give rise to tamer scenery, for the rocks are not so hard as those of the volcanic group, and there is less variety in the degree of hardness. Accordingly, they rise to the whole to less elevation, and though crags are numerous, they are on a smaller scale than those of the rocks just noticed, while the peat-covered uplands are more frequent. This type of scenery is well displayed in the country between Windermere and Coniston. The Carboniferous rocks produce two very different types of scenery, one being characteristic of the Carboniferous limestone, and the other of the millstone grit. The structure which is presented by the mountain limestone hills has been well named writing desk structure, for the gently inclined beds form gentle slopes with steep cliffs determined by the nearly vertical joints on the other sides of the hills. This structure is typically shown in Wharton Crag and Hampsfell. The bare white cliffs and fissured clints offer a marked contrast to the surfaces of the fells formed out of the slate rocks. The clints just mentioned are flat, or fairly flat, surfaces of limestone, with fissures or grikes, 
produced by the widening of the vertical joints by acidulated rainwater. The water is capable of dissolving the limestone, and the bare flat or gently sloping limestone surfaces are therefore often traversed by two sets of fissures at right angles to each other, penetrating for many feet or even yards from the surface. The sides of these are often honeycombed by the solvent action of the rain, assisted by the vegetation that may grow abundantly within. Such clints are seen on the higher parts of the two fells mentioned above. The massive, well-jointed, millstone grit, when found on fell tops, and to some extent on fell sides, produces steep scarps like those seen on the top of Cluffer and other parts of the fells lying southeast of Lancaster but the abundant growth of peat often covering glacial accumulations of these fells has prevented the extensive development of such scarps and the millstone grit tract of these high uplands is chiefly marked by somewhat dreary moorland though it is beautiful during the period when the heather is in bloom the rocks of triassic age being soft are readily worn away hence the ground occupied by them in the country west of the line between lancaster and preston is low. Furthermore, their rapid breaking up allows abundant formation of soil, and the bare rock is rarely exposed. In addition to this, a great deal of glacial material has accumulated on this low ground, and masked the rocks beneath. The effect of the ice of past ages in hollowing the valleys has been noticed in the geological chapter. We are here concerned with its deposits, we may first notice the little moraines which were left by the upland glaciers among the hills of the Coniston group. They consist of hummocky hillocks of clay, gravel and stones, covered with coarse vegetation. A very perfect example blocks the blind tarn beneath Doe Crags Coniston. The boulder clay, which was noticed in the geological chapter, is spread widely over the low-lying grounds. It is often arranged so that its upper surface forms parallel mounds like the backs of whales. These are known as drumlins and are well seen near Lancaster. Somewhat similar mounds, but composed of sand and gravel, are termed eskers. They occur in the neighbourhood of Carnforth. Latest of the deposits which have produced large effects upon the scenery are those which fill in lakes and estuarine tracts. We have seen that Coniston is being filled in by delta growth, where rivers enter the lake. Many old lakelets scattered over the district have been thus filled. Burton Moss, lying partly in Westmoreland, is an example. The estuaries of the Duddon, Leven, Kent and Loon have been silted up for long distances from their heads. Three tracks of deposit can be made out. At the old heads are the most ancient deposits often largely covered with rich peat, which gives rise to a rich, fertile soil. Seaward from this we may meet with reclaimed marshes, which are still occupied by a growth of salt marsh plants, and lastly we find the sandbanks at the mouths of the estuaries, still covered by tide at high water. Looking over these flats on the north side of Morecambe Bay, we get a combination of three types of scenery that of the Carboniferous limestone hills with the marshes below and the hills of Silurian and Ordovician rocks beyond. Such views are especially fine. In the district south of Morecambe Bay are Pilling, Cockerham and Winmarley mosses having a somewhat similar origin. We may now refer briefly to some of the minor features. The existence of sand dunes along parts of the coastline of the Duddon and again near Fleetwood and St Anne's on Sea, has already been mentioned. They are formed by onshore winds driving up the sands of the shore. They are often largely covered with spear-leaved vegetation and produce a somewhat remarkable effect. The influence of the lakes and tarns upon the scenery need merely be noticed in passing. We have said much of these sheets of water in earlier sections. The accumulations of loose blocks detached by the weather from the cliffs above to settle in fan-like forms on the slopes beneath have a considerable effect upon the character of the hillsides. These screes, as they are termed, are more extensively developed in Cumberland, 
but they are quite abundant in North Lancashire also. They are well seen below Doe Crags near Coniston Old Man, where they have blocked the end of goat's water. Many gorges have been hollowed out by stream action since the occupation of the county by ice, especially along the principal joints and the belts of smashed rock among the hills of the volcanic group of rocks. The finest of these is Tilberthwaite Gill near Coniston. They often, as at that place, contain waterfalls. The waterfalls of North Lancashire are remarkable for their beauty rather than for their size. Some of them occur in the gorges as just noted. Others are rather cascades where the waters from the upland combes pour down into the main valley, as those from the combes containing Leavers Water, Low Water and Seathwaite Tarn. Others again occur where hard rocks are found overlying soft rocks along the courses of streams. Such are found in some of the valleys flowing into the Loon from the Millstone Grit Fells. The precipices of the district are small. The principal are found among the volcanic rocks of Ordovician age, the most marked being Doe Crags. They are also found on the Carboniferous Limestone Hills, and to some extent in the scarps of the Millstone Grit country. In the limestone tracks, some remarkable features are caused by the tendency of water containing carbonic acid to dissolve the lime. The formation of grikes has already been noticed. When streamlets run from clayey ground onto the bare limestone, they rush down the fissures, and working along the bedding planes of the limestone, may excavate caverns along the latter. A well-known cavern of this type is Donald Mill Hole, near Nether Kellet. The stream which here enters the cavern has an underground course of about two and a half miles, and emerges near Carnforth. Two caves, Dog Holes on Wharton Crag and Kirkhead Cave near Cartmel, are of interest on account of the relics of animals and man which they have yielded. The influence of vegetation on the scenery will be noticed in the chapter treating of natural history, and as for the atmospheric effects, one need only remark that the variability of the climate, which is sometimes treated as a matter of regret, is responsible for scenic effects which are far more beautiful than would be the case with the climatic conditions of a more settled character. Chapter 12. Natural History Botany and zoology are the sciences which treat of the world's flora and fauna, but the study of the distribution of plants and animals, where they are found and why, forms part of the domain of geography, for from it we learn many facts concerning the past history of the land. Everyone knows by sight a certain number of the plants and animals of his own county, and this knowledge will enable him to get some idea of the way in which their geographical distribution is effected. Let us in the first place consider the plants of the county. Some of these are commonest in the south of England, others in the east, and others again in Scotland, while a very large number of the whole are spread over the entire island, and a few are very local, so far as our country is concerned. These plants have not originated where they now grow. We have seen in the geological section that the district was once occupied largely by ice. At that time, a few plants may have lived on the rocks of the higher fells, just as they do on the hills appearing above the ice of Greenland at the present day. But, as the ice receded from the county, places must have been left bare on which plants gradually sprang up, as their seeds were wafted by the wind, or brought by birds, or in some other manner from other regions. It must not be supposed that the plants which were thus brought came from the regions where they are now commonest in Britain, there are many reasons for believing that at no remote geological date, though before the beginning of historic times, England was joined to the continent to the east and south. This would afford a ready route along which the plants, which undoubtedly reached England from the continent, could gradually migrate, just as, at a later period, successive immigrations of people came along that route, having only to cross the narrow straits and as the more barbarous people were driven into the mountain fastnesses by their more highly civilised successors, so might the early plants be replaced by others, which, under altered climatic conditions, were able to flourish. 
but not all the human immigrants into Britain came by way of the narrow passage of the Straits of Dover. The seafaring Danes and Norsemen, for instance, landed sometimes on the northeast and even on the west coast of England. Similarly, some of our plants may have come in along some other route when England was united to the continent, not merely by the land now occupied by the Straits, but by land masses which once existed over part of the site of the North Sea. Certain plants, now well established, have been introduced by man. Most noticeable among these are such as grow in cornfields, which have been accidentally brought into the country together with the corn. Some have been recently introduced and are not yet established, as the small toad flax. Others, like the large blue speedwell, Veronica books Baumii, though of recent introduction, are now thoroughly established, and some, like the blue cornflower, have been so long inhabitants of the country that the period of their introduction is unknown. It will be seen from these remarks that the question as to the mode in which our county became stocked with its plants is very complicated, and as it requires much knowledge of science to sift the evidence, this part of the study of distribution is only for those who are possessed of considerable botanical knowledge. There are other facts connected with distribution, however, which can readily be tested. It will soon be found that the plants of Lancashire do not flourish equally in all parts of the county. For instance, those growing on the flats near the sea at the mouth of the Loon are very different from those which live on the higher parts of Coniston Old Man. Very little observation will show that there are two important causes of this difference among the plants of various tracts of the county, namely height above sea level and difference of soil. Let us first regard difference of altitude. Many plants are confined to tracts less than 900 feet above sea level, of which the gorse or whin is a good example. Above 1,800 feet, the bracken practically ceases. Lastly, in the belts between 1,800 and 2,700 feet, we find a remarkable assemblage of plants of an alpine character, such as the alpine campium, Lichnis alpina, and the rose root, Sedum rhodiola. The plants of this belt are found in the Coniston Hills, but are much more abundant in those parts of Lakeland which belong to the adjoining counties. It will be a useful exercise for the student to discover for himself what are the upper limits of the various plants with which he is acquainted, though he must be prepared to find an occasional straggler above the height to which the species as a whole ascends. An easier study is that of the distribution of plants according to the soil, it being remembered that this soil in many cases varies in character owing to the nature of the rock beneath, though some soils, as those formed of peat, are largely independent of the underlying rock. Some plants are confined to the muddy silt of the salt marshes by the seashore. A conspicuous example is the purple sea aster or starwort with yellow eye, aster tripolium which grows on the salt marshes of the estuaries around Morecambe Bay. Other sea plants are found on sandy or gravelly soil. Special mention must be made of a geranium, geranium lancastriense, found on Walney Island and nowhere else. The bog plants live in bogs at various heights from sea level to the tops of some of the highest hills. Among these are the louse warts, pedicularis, the insect-eating plants known as butterwort, pinguicula, and sundew, drosera, and handsomest perhaps of all, the grass of Parnassus, Parnassia palustris. In the pools among the bogs we find other plants, as the bladderworts, utricularia, and the pale blue-flowered water lobelia, lobelia dortmana. Some plants are confined to the rich soils along beck sides, as the globe flower, Trollius europaeus, and the yellow balsam, Impatiens nolimetangere, the latter a truly local plant. In the rough pastures we may find kinds of orchis, with other plants too numerous to mention. In the limestone district is a group of plants which flourish, notwithstanding the general dryness of the tract. Among such are the centauri, Erythraea centaurium, the rock rose, Helianthemum vulgare, and the lady's finger, 
Anthillis vulneraria. But the most noticeable plants of the limestone tract are those which live in the fissures of the cliffs and clints, such as the Hart's Tongue Fern and the Yew. Before leaving the consideration of the distribution of plants, there is one matter concerning which a few words must be said. We saw that at over 1,800 feet, a number of plants were found which, with us, do not occur below that height. These, however, are widely scattered in European mountain regions, many being found on the Scotch hills, the Alps of Switzerland, the mountains of Norway, and on lower ground within the Arctic Circle. They are, at the present day, mainly characteristic of Alpine and Arctic regions, and it is believed that they became established in our country during the glacial period, occupying then the British lowlands, just as they now live on the lowlands within the Arctic Circle. As the climate grew warmer, they were displaced by other plants which were able to flourish to so great an extent as to exclude these alpines, which accordingly were driven higher and higher, and are now found obtaining here and there a precarious footing upon our higher fells, from which perhaps they are doomed to disappear at no distant date. Let us hope that the disappearance, if it comes, will be natural, and not quickened by the wanton removal of the roots of the plants by the too eager collector. In a county of which the scenery has within recent times had a marked effect upon the dwellers therein, a few words may be added as to the effect of the plants upon that scenery. Many plants grow in sufficient number to produce a striking influence upon the view. The flowers of the ragwort in the rough pastures, and the curious growth of the cotton grass, when in seed, may be cited as examples. There are, however, two plants whose influence is particularly pronounced, namely the heather and the bracken. The effects of heather are most striking on the moors to the east of Lancaster. The amount of heather in the lakeland portion of Lancashire is comparatively small, but it is in this tract that the effects of the bracken are so fine. Of it, Wordsworth speaks thus, About the first week in October, the rich green, which prevailed through the whole summer, is usually passed away. The brilliant and various colours of the fern are then in harmony with the autumnal woods. Bright yellow or lemon colour at the base of the mountains, melting gradually through orange to a dark russet brown towards the summits, where the plant, being more exposed to the weather, is in a more advanced state of decay. About the animals of the district we need say less. Gifted with the power of locomotion, their distribution is as a whole wider than that of the plants. The larger quadrupeds have disappeared from the county. In prehistoric times the north of England was occupied by lions, hyenas and elephants, but they were extinct in this county before man had arrived in Lancashire though the south of England was occupied by man at the time that these beasts lived there. In historic times the wild boar, wolf, red deer and wild white cattle existed in Lancashire. It must be understood that the forest of Bowland was then true forest, forming a resort suited to these large mammals. The wolf disappeared from England about the time of Henry the Seventh, and one of its last retreats was the above-named forest. Wild boars are recorded at Horton Towers near Blackburn in 1617, and they no doubt extended to the north of the Ribble. The wild white cattle of the same place became extinct about 200 years ago, and the last herd of red deer in Bowland was destroyed in 1805. The fox is yet found on the hills, and the otter in the streams, and fox hunts and otter hunts are still exhilarating pastimes. The badger is getting very rare, and the wildcat, abundant a hundred years ago, is almost certainly extinct. Of marine animals, whales and seals are occasionally recorded, and porpoises are more common. Of the birds, the eagle has disappeared, but a number of different kinds of hawk are found, especially in the fell districts. The buzzard has nearly gone, and the merlin is rare, Sparrowhawks are fairly common and kestrels abundant. The peregrine falcon still occurs in places. Several kinds of owl are found. Along the streams we find the dipper and the kingfisher 
and the heron frequents streams and shores, though it is scarcer than it was formerly. On the moors we hear the cry of the curlew, and grouse are abundant. Good grouse moors are situated on the hills to the east and southeast of Lancaster. It may be noted that the red grouse is a bird confined to Britain. On the flats by the sea are numerous birds, such as ringed plover, turnstones, oyster catchers, dunlins and sandpipers. Certain seafowl are scarce or absent on account of the rarity of sea cliffs. Some of the birds are only winter visitants, but many breed in the district. Extensive breeding places are found in Walney Island and Pilling Moss. There is little of interest with regard to the distribution of the reptiles and amphibians, but the fishes of the county present some noteworthy features. The char, a fish characteristic of the lakes of hill regions of Britain, is found in Coniston. Of sea fish there is a great variety. The sandy tracts of Morecambe Bay support a great number of species of flat fish. Of the invertebrate creatures, much could be written in detail, but it would require considerable knowledge of zoology. Leaving the mass of these animals unnoticed, we may refer to two things. One is the abundance of edible shellfish and shrimps in the waters of Morecambe Bay. The other, the occurrence on the Coniston Fells of the mountain ringlet butterfly, Arabia epiphron, which, though occurring in Scotland, is not met with between the Lake District and Switzerland. Like the alpine plants, it is probably a survival from the organisms which spread over our country during the glacial period. Chapter 13. Climate The climate of a country is the result of the combined effect of the different variations of what is commonly termed the weather. The most important factors in determining the climate are temperature and rainfall. The great variations in the climate of the world depend mainly upon differences of latitude. Thus we speak of tropical, temperate and arctic climates, that of our country being temperate. Another important factor in controlling climate over wide tracts of country is nearness to the sea, so that along any great climatic belt we have variations according to the geographical conditions the extremes being continental climates in the centres of continents far from the oceans and insular climates in tracts surrounded by ocean. The continental climates are marked by great variations in the seasonal temperatures, the winters tending to be exceptionally cold and the summers exceptionally warm, whereas the climate of many insular tracts, including Britain, is characterised by equableness by mild winters and fairly cool summers. Again, an insular climate tends to be more humid than a continental climate. Great Britain, then, possesses a temperate insular climate. Different parts of England possess different climates, and we must now consider wherein and why the climate of North Lancashire varies from that of other parts of the country. Two especially important points must be regarded contrasting the climatic conditions of North Lancashire with those of other parts of England. Firstly, North Lancashire is further from the European continent and nearer to the Atlantic Ocean than is the eastern portion of England, and its climate therefore departs more widely from the continental type than does that of eastern England. In the second place, the North Lancashire climate is largely influenced by the great amount of elevated land within the county boundaries. As the evaporation of water and its subsequent precipitation as rain is dependent upon changes of temperature, we may consider first the temperature changes. England and Wales are situated in a belt having a mean annual temperature of about 50 degrees Fahrenheit, the mean temperature for January being about 40 degrees Fahrenheit and that for July 60 degrees Fahrenheit, and these figures hold good for North Lancashire whereas in East Anglia the January and July temperatures are about 38 degrees and 62 degrees, and in parts of Western Ireland about 42 degrees and 58 degrees respectively. It will be seen then that comparing summer and winter temperatures, East Anglia has a less equable and Western Ireland a more equable climate than North Lancashire. 
the distribution of temperature shows that latitude alone does not produce the variations otherwise it should be colder as one passes northward it has long been known that temperature variations in our island are greatly affected by the prevalent southwesterly winds bringing heat from the waters of the atlantic these waters off our coasts are exceptionally warm for their latitude owing to their movements from the warmer southwesterly seas towards our shores on the northeast this movement is that of the gulf stream a drifting of the surface waters of the atlantic in a northeasterly direction caused by the prevalent winds it is impossible here to discuss the principles which control weather changes it must suffice to say that our weather is largely influenced by the prevalence of cyclones from the atlantic the air movements are cyclonic or anticyclonic in a flowing stream we may often observe a chain of eddies bounded on either side by more gently moving water regarding the general northeasterly moving air from the atlantic as such a stream a chain of eddies may be developed in a belt parallel with its general line of movement this belt of eddies or cyclones as they are termed tends to shift its position sometimes passing over our islands at others to the northwards and at others again to the southwards to the shifting of this belt most of our weather changes are due when the country is influenced by a cyclone it is often windy while when under the influence of an anticyclone it will more probably be still and dry cyclones then are apt to be accompanied by wind and rain anticyclones by calm during which there may be bright sunshine with warmth in summer clear cold weather in winter and fog in autumn there is one period of the year when the distribution of the winds in our country is affected in a different way by the temperature of the great continental mass to the east the conditions are then such that the belt of cyclones is as it were pushed back over the ocean and we experience in our county the east winds which are often prevalent during the months of march let us now further consider the rainfall cold air can hold less water vapour than hot air and accordingly when the air rises and becomes chilled in the higher parts of the atmosphere it tends to part with its moisture as rain this air may rise by expansion which makes it lighter or by blowing up a rising land surface the importance of the latter cause is great as may be seen by studying the map of rain distribution in our island when it will be noticed that the areas of high rainfall coincide with the elevated regions the prevailing winds are from the west and south and the large amount of rain which falls in north lancashire is mainly due to the vapour laden winds from the atlantic being forced up the hills and precipitating their moisture and accordingly the greatest amount of rainfall occurs practically on the tops of the ridges which face the ocean the greatest rainfall in the county occurs in the hilly district in most parts of which it varies from forty to sixty inches per annum the heaviest fall is in the high ground of the coniston fells where it amounts to about eighty inches though much rain also descends on the hilly tracts of the south-east the lancashire plain between the ribble and the wire receives only from thirty to forty inches per annum it may be remarked that the driest part of england has less than twenty inches per annum the amount of sunshine recorded varies in different parts of england the greatest amount being in the south and east and the least in the southern part of the pennines along the greater part of the south-west more than one thousand seven hundred hours per annum are recorded the smallest amount for england is under one thousand two hundred hours north lancashire lies in a belt receiving more than one thousand two hundred and less than one thousand four hundred hours severe frost is not so frequent in north lancashire as it is in parts of southeastern england where the average winter temperature is lower snow falls in the winter season on the higher fells and often lies long there but there is no very great amount of snow in the lower tracts chapter fourteen people race language settlements population we have no written record of the history of our land carrying us beyond the roman invasion in b c fifty five 
but owing to the discovery of various relics which are being revealed to us by the plough of the farmer and the spade of the antiquary we know that man inhabited it for ages before this date so remote are the times in which the forerunners of our race flourished that antiquaries have not ventured either to date their advent or to give an idea as to the length of time during which each division in which they have arranged them lasted it must therefore be understood that the divisions or ages of the times when man existed in this country before the advent of the romans are as yet vaguely separated from one another when the romans invaded our island it was occupied by people whom we are accustomed to speak of popularly as the early britons these people however were not all of one race and we may briefly consider who they were of the earliest inhabitants of our land known as the paleolithic men men of the old stone age we have no trace save the implements which they left behind and of these we know of none which have been found in lancashire it is by no means certain however that lancashire was not inhabited by these paleolithic men at any rate towards the end of paleolithic times in these times man was in a somewhat primitive state he did not till the land and it is doubtful whether he had domesticated any animals he occupied caverns though no doubt also living in the open and probably clothed himself exclusively in skins long after the disappearance of these people a short swarthy race arrived from the continent and spread widely over britain certainly penetrating into north lancashire as indicated by their relics neolithic man was in a much more advanced state of civilization than his precursor he tilled the land bred stock made rude pottery and erected remarkable monuments he had nevertheless not yet discovered the use of the metals and his implements and weapons were still made of stone or bone though the former were often beautifully shaped and polished the nature of these instruments will be more fully noticed in the chapter upon antiquities whence these neolithic or new stone age men came and who they were we know not for certain all we can say is that they were an earlier set of immigrants than the celts who succeeded them these early men were displaced by a taller and more powerful people armed with better weapons who however probably did not completely destroy their conquered enemies but held the survivors in bondage as slaves the more powerful race the celts are supposed to have come into britain at two distinct times the earlier immigration was of a celtic race who spoke a language like the modern gaelic these people are known as the goidels or gales subsequently another celtic race the brythons speaking a language like welsh arrived these people were acquainted with the use of metals stone was gradually replaced by copper and bronze and before the occupation of the romans the latter had largely given place to iron the discovery of the method of smelting the ores of copper and tin and of mixing them was doubtless a slow affair and the bronze weapons must have been ages in supplanting those of stone for lack of intercommunication at that time presented enormous difficulties to the spread of knowledge bronze age man in addition to fashioning beautiful weapons and implements made good pottery and buried his dead in circular barrows there were then in our county even if paleolithic man never arrived there three races before the roman invasion one pre-celtic and two celtic though some believe that the inhabitants of what is now lancashire were essentially goidels be this as it may at the time of the arrival of romans the north of england including lancashire was occupied by a powerful celtic tribe that of the brigantes this tribe was divided into sub-tribes but their distribution is uncertain and it will be sufficient for our purpose to know that the people of the brigantes in those days inhabited what is now lancashire it is doubtful whether any important town of the brigantes lay in lancashire territory and whether any traces of the brigantes can be found among the characteristics of the existing people of lancashire but many of their place names still survive in the first century a d the influence of the romans began to be felt 
and was exerted in Lancashire for nearly 400 years. Important as was the civilising influence of the Romans upon the inhabitants, as we shall see in a later chapter when we come to speak of the roads and other relics of that people, the Roman occupation produced little permanent effect upon the physical characters and the language of the inhabitants. The occupation was essentially military, and the Roman legions were composed of a soldiery of mixed race, gathered by the Romans from various quarters of Europe. After the departure of the Romans in the 5th century, we know practically nothing of what happened in the district, except that for about two centuries it was occupied by the Brythons or Britons. In the 7th century, the Anglo-Saxons entered the district, and it became part of the English kingdom of Northumbria. In the ninth and 10th centuries, Danes and Norsemen entered the district from the northeast and from the sea, settling especially in the fertile tracts along the coast. William Rufus, in the year 1092, brought an army to the north, and the Norman settlement of what is now North Lancashire began. This was the last important immigration of the various races into that area. Of these invasions, that of the Romans had a striking effect upon the civilization of the people, that of the Anglo-Saxons gave us our language, afterwards modified by Norman influence, while that of the Danes and Norsemen doubtless considerably affected the present physical characters of the inhabitants of North Lancashire. It has been well said that the history of a county is written on the face of the country itself, in the names of its towns and villages, its rivers, mountains and lakes, and so we shall find that the North Lancashire place names give much evidence of the character of the different invasions. The effective displacement of the Britons by the Anglo-Saxons is shown by the rarity of British place names for towns and villages, although they were still largely used for physical features. Of British place names we may note Leven, Ribble and Morecambe. Anglo-Saxon villages often end in ton, originally an enclosure, or with ham. Examples are Dalton, Overton, Wennington, Aldingham, Kirkham. Among Norse and Danish words we have be, a village, as Nateby and Kirkby, Thwaite, a clearing, as Seathwaite, Alithwaite and Brackenthwaite, Ness, a promontory, as in Amounderness, and many others. Traces of settlements of the pre-Roman dwellers in the district have been found in many places, often on high ground. The Anglo-Saxon, Danish and Norse immigrants probably occupied some of the settlements which had been founded by their predecessors, but there is no doubt that they founded many new hamlets and villages. On the arrival of the Normans, the country was parcelled out into larger areas and divided among the Norman barons, under whom the general mass of the inhabitants lived as bondsmen. But no doubt those who dwelt in the more remote uplands remained undisturbed in the possession of their small freehold estates. The population of Lancashire as a whole, as stated in Chapter 2, was 4,768,474 in 1911, that of North Lancashire being about 400,000. With the exception of the County of London, it has the largest population of all the English counties. It has an average of 2,550 people per square mile, as compared with the average of 618 per square mile for the whole of England and Wales. North Lancashire, however, where the population is much less dense, has only about 640 people per square mile. End of chapters 11 to 14